John Miko, the Executive Director of the Union League Legacy Foundation. And it's my pleasure to welcome you to 
this evening's Civil War Roundtable. The Legacy Foundation is the nonprofit charity of the Union League of Philadelphia, guided by the United States Constitution and by the history, the values, and the spirit of the Union League of Philadelphia. The Legacy Foundation endeavors to make more informed, more engaged citizen leaders from our members, from the public, from students and others. We do this through civics education, through college scholarships for, uh, for high school, deserving high school students who will be tomorrow citizen leaders, through lectures and through a host of programs like tonight's Civil War Roundtable. We're also in the last couple of weeks and months uh, have taken on the added responsibility of management fundraising for the Union League Employee Emergency Fund. And we've raised over $600,000 to date to help uh, the families and employees who have been furloughed during the current uh, government shutdown and our current crisis. So my thanks to all the members that have supported us and their Union League family so generously. Uh, I also want to thank our Founder Circle and Lincoln Leaders, uh, those people, those members that give so generously to all the work that we do. It's through your support that we're able to provide uh, so much education programs and care for the great collections uh, of the Union League of Philadelphia. My thanks. So before we get into tonight's uh, program, just a few housekeeping items. Uh, for those of you that are watching on Zoom, you can use the Q&A button, which is down on the bottom in the center of your screen and that will, you can just type in questions during the course of the program. Uh, our speaker will get to as many of those as she can towards the uh, end of her talk. Um, if you're on YouTube, unfortunately, you will not be able to ask questions through the YouTube, uh, through your YouTube. So uh, with that, it is now my great pleasure to introduce to you someone who needs no introduction to those of us who love and know the Union League, the historian of the Union League Legacy Foundation, Mr. James Mundy. Jim. Thank you very, very much for that. I'm flattered and honored. I really mean that sincerely. Um, but, uh, I hope I don't sound like too much of a civil war geek, but I've been waiting for this night all year. Uh, it's um, when Elizabeth was at teaching at Temple, we weren't able to get her down to the league and here she is in Charlottesville and she's finally at the league if virtually. So, uh, and who would have thought that after 150 plus years, there was something new to talk about the Civil War, but it goes to show that there is always something new about something that old. So, so this should be a humdinger of a program. So let me get on with the formalities. Elizabeth Varon is the Langborn M. Williams Professor of American History at the University of Virginia and the Associate Director of the John L. Now III Center for Civil War History. Elizabeth grew up in Northern Virginia, which might explain why she's back in Charlottesville. She received her undergraduate degree from Swarthmore College and her PhD from Yale University, and has held teaching positions at Wellesley College and Temple University. So Philadelphia's loss is Charlottesville's gain. Uh, Elizabeth is a specialist in Civil War history and 19th century era Southern history. She is the author of a number of books, including We Mean to Be Counted, White Women and Politics in Antebellum, Virginia, Southern Lady, Yankee Spy, The True Story of Elizabeth Van Lu, A Union Agent in the Heart of the Confederacy. That's a great book. Read it. This Union, The Coming of the American Civil War, 1789 to 1859. Another good book. And then Appomattox, Victory, Defeat, and Freedom at the End of the Civil War. Uh, Dr. Varon's books have won her numerous awards and prizes, not surprisingly. Her public presentations include book talks at the Lincoln Bicentennial in Springfield, at Gettysburg Civil War Institute, and on C-SPAN's Book TV. She is also a featured speaker in the Organization of American Historians Distinguished Lectureship Program. It is my even greater pleasure and honor to introduce Dr. Elizabeth Varon, who will talk on her new book, Armies of Deliverance, A New History of the Civil War. Elizabeth, thank you for joining us. but I am happy to uh, be here um, uh, virtually and to talk with you all about the Civil War and particularly about what motivated Northerners to fight it. I'll start with some reflections on how my book Armies of Deliverance took shape and then I'll give you an overview of some of the book's key themes. As a number of reviewers have noted, Armies of Deliverance is dedicated to the proposition that, as Frederick Douglass put it memorably, there was a right side and a wrong side in the Civil War and that the right side won. Now that may seem an obvious enough 
proposition, but I'll say a few words as I close my talk today about why it's still necessary to make that point and to defend it in America in 2020. So let me note an opening, as Jim noted, that I'm, I'm primarily a historian of the South by training and particularly Virginia history. I grew up in Virginia and have always been fascinated by its past. So when I was commissioned some years ago now to write an overview of the entire Civil War, uh, commissioned by Oxford University Press, who brought out this recent book, I knew this would involve a learning curve for me. I'd have to get up to speed on the vast literature on the Civil War North. And I began researching this book with a method in mind, as we historians say, but not uh, without any uh, sort of central question or provisional thesis. The method was to integrate military and social history, the battlefront and the home front, into a, an account, a holistic account, featuring a wide array of firsthand voices so readers could experience the war viscerally in real time as it unfolded. But along the way in my research process, as I began working my way through major battles and campaigns and themes like civil war, medicine, and so on, I kept encountering something I hadn't expected to find, namely the theme of my book, the theme of deliverance. The claim by Northerners that the purpose of the war, as they saw it, was not to conquer the South or to subjugate the South, but instead to save the South, to deliver the South, to save the Southern masses from their own leaders, and to deliver to Southern whites and Blacks alike the blessings of free society. And I found this deliverance rhetoric, if you will, these professions that the purpose of the war was to save the South, I found it once I, I uh, sort of uh, uh, identified this as a major theme and was attuned to what was in the sources. I found it in public propaganda. I found it in private writings by soldiers and civilians alike. I found it across the landscape of the Union War in New England and the Mid-Atlantic and the Midwest and the border states and even among some anti-Confederate Southerners in the seceded states. I'll have more to say about them momentarily. I found the theme of deliverance, these professions of saving the South across the broad political spectrum in the North among Democrats and Republicans and abolitionists. And it wasn't only the uh, scope of this rhetoric, but its persistence from the war's very start until its finish that surprised me. Unionists persisted in believing that they could save the South even in the face of massive evidence that Confederates did not want to be saved. How was that possible? Well, to provide you with an answer to this question, I'm gonna hone in today on three of the big topics in my book, the experience of Union soldiers, the process of emancipation, and then Lincoln's re-election campaign in 1864 as a moment that brings some key threads together. And I aim to show that the theme of deliverance was so powerful that it drew followers like a magnet to the Union cause and enabled Abraham Lincoln to forge a broad coalition for winning the war. And I'll propose to you all this afternoon that the power of deliverance lay in its, as a theme, lay in its political utility, but also in its emotional resonance. So let me start with a little bit of pre-war context just to set the stage. Deliverance rhetoric had its roots in a Northern critique of the South that Republicans like Abraham Lincoln had popularized in the pre-war period. According to that critique, the institution of slavery had rendered the South undemocratic and unproductive. Only one in four white Southern families owned slaves, but slaveholders clearly dominated Southern politics and they did so, Republicans in the North argued, by depriving the Southern masses, the Southern citizenry of free speech, of education, of economic opportunity, of social and technological progress. During the secession crisis, as uh, we get closer to the war, this critique of the South resonated very broadly in the North with progressive anti-slavery voters on the one hand, but also with conservative Northern Democrats who felt betrayed by the Southern wing of their own Democratic Party. And this uh, deliverance rhetoric primed Northerners to believe 
when secession came that a cunning group of secessionist conspirators had duped and seduced and terrorized the Southern masses into leaving the Union. As the New York Times put it in a June 1861 editorial, and I quote, the people of the South are regarded as our brethren, deluded, deceived, betrayed, plundered of their freedom of inquiry, of speech and action, forced into treason by bold bad men, the secessionists, bold bad men. If only the spell of secession could be broken and Southerners induced to cast off their false idols, Northerners reckon the latent unionism of the Southern masses would assert itself. These are the hopes with which Northerners go into the war. And Union soldiers march off to war with these deliverance appeals literally ringing in their ears. As a local dignitary told one Massachusetts regiment at their send off in the spring of 1861, quote, there are millions of the white race in the South who daily pray to God for a sight of your advancing columns as their only hope of salvation from a bondage worse than death. Over the course of the, the war Union soldiers would profess and repeat like a mantra their pledge to save the South. Take, for example, the correspondence of a private Charles W. Sherman of the 12th Connecticut Volunteers. Sherman wrote 160 some letters home to his family over the course of nearly three years of fighting in Louisiana and in Virginia's Shenandoah Valley. And in those letters, Sherman repeatedly described the war as a struggle to break the hold that slave-holding oligarchs had over the white Southern masses. In the spring of 1862, as New Orleans fell to Union forces, Sherman observed of the South's common whites, quote, they do not think for themselves, but let their political leaders lead them by the nose wherever they please. Sherman looked forward to a time when this deluded people, as he called Southerners, would be, quote, brought back to the faith and love of its youth. Now, I emphasize in my book that such language filled emotional needs for soldiers like Sherman. Across the North's broad political spectrum, soldiers shared a fealty to what historians have called the affective theory of union, as in affection. The idea that the union was designed by the founders to be consensual rather than coercive, bound together, not by force, but by the mutual affection of its citizens. The Union Army citizen soldiers believed that bonds of affection were what made the Union exceptional in the world, a shining beacon of representative government. Thus, to achieve victory, Union soldiers like Charles Sherman reckoned, the North had to do more than defeat Confederates on the battlefield. They had to teach Southerners to love the Union again. And by distinguishing as it did, between the guilty Southern elite who could be punished and the redeemable masses, deliverance rhetoric helped Northerners maintain this hope of restoring an effective union held together by heartstrings. For Northern soldiers, the deliverance of the South also meant reclaiming the Southern landscape. As they marched through the Confederacy, Union soldiers commented extensively on the Southern terrain as you'd expect, but they didn't see the Southern terrain, the South simply as enemy country, forbidding and hostile. Instead, they saw Southern soil as part of their own national history, their own patrimony. They saw the South as a land of faded glory and unmet potential that slavery had degraded and that a free labor system would regenerate. This country is a wonder to all Yankees, Charles H. Brewster of the 10th Massachusetts wrote, in April of 1862 from Eastern Virginia. There's no reason why this should not be as thickly settled and thriving as any country on the face of the globe. The soil is good and the climate too and everything grows here that we could wish and it would be a magnificent region, he continued, but for the curse of slavery, which has blighted it. Men like Brewster believed that as the federal army moved through the South, it would bring progress and prosperity in its wake. Deliverance rhetoric also served for Union soldiers as a counterweight to feelings of bitterness and vengeance. Naturally, Northerners yearned to establish the justness of their war and imagining themselves as liberators, not conquerors, helped them defend escalating hard war tactics, confiscation, sieges, bombardment, and other such tactics which targeted the Southern home front and infrastructure. 
none other than a, a second Sherman, a better known Sherman, William Tecumseh Sherman, the premier symbol of the Union's hard war, imagined himself as a liberator of Southern whites. He aimed to prove to the Confederate people that their leaders could not protect them. And thus, as he put it, to expose as lies the false political doctrine on which secession rested. Sherman instructed his soldiers that they should, as they meted out destruction on their famous march through Georgia, quote, discriminate between the rich, who are usually hostile, and the poor and industrious, usually neutral or friendly. In Sherman's view, in his hope, as the Union Army exacted its toll on the rebel elite, the Southern masses would, and here again I quote him, discover the error of their ways and repent of their hasty action and bless those who have maintained a constitutional government strong enough to protect its citizens. So all of this rhetoric, these hopes of saving the South, saving the Southern masses from the secessionist oligarchs, all of this begs the question, how much latent unionism was there among whites in the Confederacy? Of course, we historians have the benefit of hindsight and it's quite clear in hindsight that Lincoln and other Northerners were wrong in imagining that the masses of white Southerners yearned for deliverance. Unionism was in short supply among whites in the seceded states, while Southern nationalism proved to be widespread and resilient. And this resilience of, of separatism, nationalism, of Confederate ideology reflected some social factors that Northern ideology had failed to account for of course, it's true that only one in four white Southern families owned slaves, but if we add to that one in four, the number of whites who worked for slave owners, who rented or hired slaves, who were related to slaveholders or hoped one day to own slaves, we can see that a broad swath of Southern whites were invested in slavery as a system of profit making and of racial control. And of course, Confederate resilience also reflected the power of Southern propaganda, about which I'll now say a few words. The premise of the Confederate war effort was that Northerners and Southerners could never again be countrymen. Confederates were determined from the start to discredit and to silence Yankee appeals to the Southern masses. And thus from the start of the war to its finish, and indeed, even before the first shots were fired, Confederate propaganda insisted that the North waged ruthless, remorseless war, and that Northerners sought the brutal conquest, not the liberation of the South. I'll give you some representative rhetoric. Quote, blood, thunder, fire, smoke, rapine, and entire subjugation are now the favorite terms of the Northmen who were bent upon violence and extermination. So uh, reported the Richmond Daily Dispatch in May of 1861. It added in, in a typical formulation that Lincoln was mustering a mercenary army of quote, cutthroats, outlaws, and vagabonds motivated by greed and blood lust. This was the Confederate image of the Yankee army. And of course it was a far cry from the federal troops own self image as liberators. Over the course of the war, the rising tide of death and destruction intensified the fervor of diehard Confederates. And as the Union army took aim at slavery, a theme I'll return to, Confederates reviled the Emancipation Proclamation as the culminating proof that any reunion between the North and South was utterly impossible. None of this boded well for Southern unionism. And indeed, as I've suggested, unionists never materialized in the seceded states in the numbers Northerners hoped for. But my key point is this, Union soldiers remained committed to saving the South, to Southern deliverance, because that commitment was ideological. Soldiers fit the facts to conform to their belief system, a belief system that emphasized man's capacity to reform and repent. Northerners went to war hoping to change Southern hearts and minds, and they never stopped believing that they could. I'll address one more crucial facet of the battlefront before turning to politics on the home front. The composition of the Union Army changed dramatically midway through the war as African-American men were finally permitted to join its ranks. The more than 200,000 black men who served in the Federal Army and Navy represented an infusion of fighting power and courage and morale 
that of course proved critical to the Union's ultimate victory. Black troops too wrote and spoke of the war as a war of liberation. They cursed the slave power oligarchs. They heralded the potential of free labor to remake the region. But black soldiers defined deliverance more broadly than white ones did. They understood themselves to be fighting a battle on two fronts against the horrors of Southern slavery and racism and against persistent racial discrimination in the North where they were free but relegated to a second class citizenship. So deliverance connoted for them more than freedom from bondage. It connoted full citizenship and full inclusion in American society. I'll turn now to the crucial role of deliverance rhetoric in the story of emancipation. Lincoln faced the challenge as president of managing a divided home front. His critics on his right in the North and the Democratic Party, the opposition party, sternly warned him not to take any radical steps against slavery. His critics on his left in his own party, the radical Republicans urged him to move more quickly toward abolition. So how then did Lincoln's emancipation policy take shape? The conventional explanation is that Lincoln initially avoided drastic action against slavery for fear of alienating conservatives and moderates in the North, but gradually came to embrace emancipation when he saw the events on the ground, most notably the mass exodus of Southern slaves from plantations toward the Union Army. When he saw that these events on the ground were eroding the institution of slavery. Lincoln then justified emancipation for a skeptical Northern electorate primarily on expedient grounds as a military necessity, a way of punishing the Confederacy by depriving it of resources. In other words, the prevailing scholarly interpretation emphasizes Lincoln's pragmatism. My emphasis in my book, by contrast, is on Lincoln's idealism, on the case that he and his allies made that black freedom would have broad benefits for all Americans, including and especially for the South's common whites. Slavery, Lincoln reasoned, was the root source of Southern despotism. Slavery was the main obstacle to national reunion. In giving freedom to the slave, we assure freedom to the free, honorable alike in what we give and what we preserve, Lincoln famously pronounced in his December 1862 annual message to Congress, arguing in effect that black freedom would enhance white freedom. Lincoln was echoed by many of the North's most influential public figures. Harriet Beecher Stowe, the celebrated author of Uncle Tom's Cabin, for example, wrote that the Emancipation Proclamation promised not only the liberation of the slaves, but of white Southerners too. It would deliver our misguided brethren from the wages of sin, she explained. Union League clubs were absolutely essential in spreading this message, this message that the end of black slavery would liberate the white men of the South from ignorance and falsehood. Crucially, Lincoln and his party, Union Leagues included, enlisted slave state whites in making this case, a small but significant number of them. Four slave states, Kentucky, Maryland, Missouri, and Delaware, had resisted the siren song of secession and keeping them in the Union fold was a major strategic priority for Lincoln. And so men from these states who were willing to endorse emancipation, men like uh, Kentucky's Cassius Clay and Robert J. Breckinridge, became valuable allies for Lincoln making the case for emancipation in these slaveholding border states. Equally important was a very small vanguard of white Southerners from Confederate states who were willing to stand by the Union and defend Lincoln's policies. The most influential of these unionists, Andrew Johnson of Tennessee, for example, and Andrew Jackson Hamilton of Texas, cast the Emancipation Proclamation as a seeming punishment that would in time do momentous good. For example, Hamilton the Texan in a January 1864 pamphlet addressed to his fellow Texans promised that their sins would be pardoned if quote, like the prodigal son, they repent and ask to be forgiven. Emancipation would deliver whites from their present bondage, as he put it, and set Texas forth on a new career of prosperity. As Hamilton's reference to the prodigal son suggests, loyal Americans turned to metaphors 
to conjure how the Union would save the South. Confederates and Union rhetoric were pupils who needed teaching, patients who needed curing, children who needed parenting, heathens who needed converting, drunkards who should sober up, madmen who needed to come to their senses, errant brethren who should return to the path of righteousness, prodigal sons, as we've heard, who should return home. Again, the richness of 19th century language on display here. In a medical era in which pain itself was seen as a sign of healing, oftentimes these metaphors of deliverance invoked the redemptive nature of suffering itself. Dr. Elizabeth Blackwell of the Women's Loyal National League used a medical analogy in which the South was a wounded limb. We have no idea of lopping off the offending member, she said, let us bear with it and heal its infirmities, even if we are forced to apply the severest remedies. Images of religious purification also abounded in these metaphors. Describing the Union War as a holy war, the prominent Unitarian minister and sanitary commission head and Union League organizer, Henry Bellows, intoned from his New York City pulpit, quote, we smite to heal and resist to bless and kill to make alive. Again, pain and suffering that will bring uh, good in its wake. African-American abolitionists who have long been in the vanguard of the anti-slavery movement made their own distinct contributions to deliverance discourse. Their focus was on how black freedom and citizenship could redeem America not only from slavery, but also from the sin and the burden of racism. The Old Testament story of Israel's exodus from Egyptian bondage was central to anti-slavery politics, as were other biblical texts, such as the story of the year of Jubilee from the book of Leviticus. Providential images of God's will abounded in African-American commentary on the Emancipation Proclamation. The year of Jubilee has come, a January 1st, 1863 editorial in the black newspaper, The Pacific Appeal proclaimed, the deep lamentations of slaves, how long, how long, O Lord, before our deliverance shall come to pass, had finally been answered. Highlighting the crucial role of slave resistance and of black military service in undermining the Confederacy, African-American leaders argued that the only sure way to reclaim the South for the Union was to grant full citizenship and voting rights to, to former slaves. These were, after all, the truest of the South's unionists. And it's important to note that of the 200,000 African-American men who served in the Union Army, nearly 80% were Southerners. The more men you make free, the more freedom is strengthened. And the more men you give an interest in the welfare of the state, the greater is the security of the state. Frederick Douglass intoned. Give the men, give men the vote, give them a stake in society. This was, in Douglass's view, the true path, as he put it, to permanent peace and prosperity. The activist and poet Francis Ellen Watkins Harper agreed, declaring the lesson of the war to be this, quote, simple justice is the right of every race, unquote. There were, in, in short, varying degrees of anti-slavery sentiment among unionists. But what I want to emphasize is this. Together, those who championed emancipation did something quite radical during the Civil War. In claiming that Black freedom would enhance white freedom, they were rejecting a very old zero-sum game theory of race relations that had prevailed in America up until that time. They rejected the age-old pro-slavery argument that black freedom could only come at the expense of white freedom, that any gains for blacks would be losses for whites. Their idealistic defense of emancipation was a bold argument and the potential for deliverance rhetoric to mobilize and unite loyalists was given a stern test in 1864 when all of Lincoln's policies faced a referendum in the election of 1864. So let me say a few words about that theme before uh, moving to my conclusions. Lincoln's reelection was not a foregone conclusion, as you all uh, know well. And to understand how he prevailed, we have to recognize that his election campaign of 1864 was a referendum not only on emancipation, but also on Lincoln's other signature policy, his program of amnesty to Confederates. 
announced in December of 1863. Much less known and well understood than emancipation, but very, very important. Lincoln's amnesty program offered forgiveness and a restoration of political rights to any white Southerner who took a loyalty oath, an oath of future loyalty, accepting abolition and pledging future allegiance to the Union. The amnesty plan also offered readmission to seceded states that could form an electoral core of these oath-taking loyalists equal to 10% of a given state's 1860 electorate, hence the nickname the 10% plan for this amnesty proposal. And Lincoln imagined that states like Louisiana, Tennessee, Arkansas, where there was a strong union occupation force and, and a vanguard of homegrown unionists, that these states would lead the way and model for other Confederate states how to re-enter the national fold under this 10% plan. Now, it's impossible to overstate how enthusiastic Lincoln was about this amnesty plan, how hopeful he was that it would appeal to wavering Confederates uh, and maybe even encourage mass desertion from the rebel army. Union scouts carried the amnesty proclamation to enemy lines, cavalry expeditions were sent out, supplied with it, copies of the amnesty proclamation were left behind in Southern dwellings uh, and so on. Indeed for Lincoln, the emancipation of blacks and, the, and amnesty for whites were two sides of the same coin. And his linkage of these two policies was integral to the presidential contest of 1864. Hoping to attract a wide range of voters, Lincoln and his allies in 1864 dropped the party label Republican, which was divisive, and they chose the new moniker, the National Union Party, to emphasize patriotism over partisanship. The best way uh, to neutralize the threat from Democrats and from their candidate, George McClellan, was uh, to take this moral high ground. McClellan, of course, uh, and the Democrats had adopted a controversial platform, which declared the war effort a failure and called for an armistice and negotiated peace. The most strident of Lincoln's critics in the North, the so-called Copperhead Democrats, seemed willing to concede independence to the Confederates as part of those negotiations. Copperheads, virulently racist, condemned emancipation, and echoed Confederates in portraying Abraham Lincoln as a remorseless tyrant. But Lincoln would not permit himself to be painted as a conqueror. The National Union Party's campaign was built around the theme of Southern deliverance. Lincoln chose as his running mate, the most celebrated of all white Southern loyalists, Andrew Johnson of Tennessee. Lincoln's moderate and conservative supporters in the North could hold up amnesty as his signature policy, as his crowning achievement. The Franklin Repository of Pennsylvania, for example, noted approvingly of Lincoln's amnesty policy that the president still aimed at the great end, the disenthrallment of a great people, by which the paper meant the Southern people. In other words, the National Union Party attempted to grow Lincoln's coalition by perfecting a sort of big tent approach. While Lincoln's mainstream backers emphasized the theme of amnesty and deliverance, Radical Republicans and abolitionists foregrounded black freedom and citizenship as their main themes. Frederick Douglass criticized Lincoln's amnesty policy for failing to establish black voting rights as a precondition for the Southern states reentry into the union. But Douglass of course, nonetheless endorsed Lincoln in 1864. He knew that although the Republican party wasn't perfect, the Democratic party represented something far worse as Douglas put it, a McClellan victory would, quote, restore slavery to all its ancient power and make this government just what it was before the rebellion, simply an instrument of the slave power. Abolitionists supported Lincoln, in other words, because the choice was between moving forward and jumping backward, as one of them pithily put it. In the end, Lincoln won a resounding victory in 1864, 212 electoral votes to McClellan's 21. And it's revealing that Lincoln won electoral votes from Missouri and Maryland and West Virginia, it's all a uh, slave uh, territory, uh, which had abolished, all of which ab abolished slavery. These were seen as examples of how deliverance uh, policy was working to bring some Southerners around. At this crucial juncture of the war in 1864, 
Lincoln had not only maintained his coalition, he'd expanded it, winning a greater electoral mandate than he had claimed back in 1860. Calling Lincoln's victory at the ballot box the great deliverance, Reverend Cornelius Edgar of Easton, Pennsylvania, marveled at how the president's conduct of the war had, quote, magnetized, blended, harmonized, unified the discordant elements of Northern public opinion. Quoting Psalm 144, Edgar prayed that God would finish the work of delivering the nation from the hand of falsehood. The fall of the last rebel strongholds to the federal army in the spring of 1865 brought deliverance full circle. After the Union Army entered Richmond, Secretary of War Edwin Stanton gave an impromptu address to a rejoicing throng at the War Department in Washington, DC, declaring, quote, in this great hour of triumph, my heart, as well as yours, is penetrated with gratitude to Almighty God for his deliverance of the nation. He will teach us how to be just in this hour of victory. But of course, Confederate surrender would reveal to the Northern public the depths of Southern defiance. Grant's lenient terms at Appomattox were intended to ease reunion by affecting Confederate submission and repentance. As Lincoln fell to an assassin's bullet, however, loyal Americans began to grasp that no such Southern repentance was forthcoming. The slave power conspiracy was crushed, but the Southern masses had no intention of repudiating their leaders or renouncing their lost cause. Although deliverance rhetoric had helped to promote solidarity among unionists, it ultimately failed to convince Confederate whites to accept peace or black freedom on the union's terms. Moreover, in, in a political dynamic that we often see unfold at the end of wars, once the shared goal of defeating the secessionists, the slave power conspiracy was accomplished, the unionist coalition with all these divergent elements lost its common purpose and disagreements over the meaning of the victory, the meaning of freedom came to the fore. And of course, the most striking example of this is in the conduct of Lincoln's successor, Andrew Johnson. During the war, Johnson, the Tennessee Unionist, had fancied himself a liberator and had gone so far as to describe himself as a quote unquote Moses to enslaved blacks. But after the war, Johnson's own deep racism came to the fore. He defined black freedom narrowly, only as the right to earn wages, but not the right to full citizenship. And he cynically revived zero sum game racial thinking, suggesting that any gains for blacks would come at the expense of whites. Indeed, Johnson used the presidency to push a reactionary argument the argument that the Southern masses who had been victory of elite slave, uh, rather had been victims of, of uh, elite slaveholders during the war were rendered the victims during post-war reconstruction of radical Republicans and their egalitarian agenda of black civil rights. And so Johnson pledged he'd fight radical Republicans after the war, just as he had fought secessionists during the war. As former Confederates regained power and drove blacks out of Southern politics, the long lived hope that the white Southern masses could be delivered ran aground on the shoals of recalcitrance and racism. Congress's bold attempt to remake the South under Johnson's successor US Grant was assailed by propaganda and by violence from the very moment it started as former Confederates ratcheted up their campaign to turn back social change. The resurgence of the Southern Democrats in the 1870s went hand in hand with the spread of lost cause ideology, romanticizing slavery in the Confederacy. And it was these grim developments that led Frederick Douglass to lament in 1878 that a lawless spirit was rampant in the South, running roughshod over the causes of union and freedom. He called upon Americans to remember, quote, there was a right side and a wrong side in the late war, which no sentiment ought to cause us to forget. And while today we should have malice toward none and charity toward all, it is no part of our duty to confound right with wrong or loyalty with treason. My book, Armies of Deliverance, aims to help us better understand Douglas's plea and also to better appreciate its continued relevance. Now, again, as I said at the outset, one would like to imagine that modern Americans in the year 2020 could agree that the right side won the war. But of course, we've had sobering reminders in recent years, especially in my hometown of Charlottesville and in connection with debates over Confederate statues. 
that false equivalency, the view that the Union and Confederate causes are equally deserving of honor, has made a comeback. I would like to close my talk today by asking us to remain vigilant in refuting such false equivalency. My book emphasizes the fundamental idealism of the Union War. Now, I'm not claiming that all Northerners were saints and that all Southerners were demons. Indeed, a major goal of the book is to reveal the divisions within each section. Neither section was a monolith. But even after we've accounted for the political variability in the North and the South, even after we've accounted for all the war's excesses, its brutality and costs, the human suffering and fallibility on both sides, it remains irrefutable that the Union and the Confederacy represented two starkly different political systems. One that had opened the door to change to slavery's demise. The other that wanted to chain that door shut and throw away the key. One that upheld the principle of majority rule, the other that rejected it. One premised on the idea that Northerners and Southerners shared a common destiny, the other on the idea that they could never again be countrymen. One system that gave us Lincoln, arguably our greatest president, a man of humility and moral growth and striving, the other that set up false idols like Lee in a spirit of defiance and division. One, as Frederick Douglass himself put it, based on the broadest and grandest declaration of human rights the world ever heard or read, and the other based upon an open, bold, and shocking denial of all right. The right side won, and it falls to us still to fulfill the promise of that victory. Thank you. I am uh, now happy to take questions uh, if people have them. Any questions, friends? All right. Liz, if I can pop in. Please do. All righty. First off, I, I, I'm going to re-listen to your conclusions. I think there were some wonderful remarks there that we don't pay attention to, and, and, and especially the issues of right and wrong, which are really phenomenal. But um, I really wanted to say thank you for getting a plug-in for the union leagues. Uh, <laughs> okay. Yeah, my I, pleasure. I think the leagues are still very much an understudied, underappreciated, undervalued component of, uh, this, of Civil War history. In the, you know, in the North and in the South as well, because there were union leagues in the South. To kind of reinforce your point that, you know, there were pro-unionists in the South itself. So, so, um, so. Yeah, it, it's very, very important uh, to, to note the contribution of the Union League, both during the war and during Reconstruction. It, it's a pity that it, the organizations are sometimes overlooked because of course they had these publication societies that churned out a massive, uh, 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 the amount of political rhetoric which we can which we can study uh, and again which was meant to mobilize support for for Lincoln and for and, and for emancipation uh, and so I, I found it to be absolutely uh, central uh, to this project of um, motivating northerners to fight a long and bloody war and sustaining their morale uh, and their sense of purpose, uh, uh, moral purpose in, in particular. I see some questions are coming in, which I'm, um, which I'm happy to uh, uh, begin to answer. Uh, first question came in, asks about class in, in the South. Uh, and um, class divisions uh, are, are a really, really important theme. The no Northerners were counting on class divisions to be decisive. They imagined that since slaveholders owned the preponderance of wealth and controlled the political levers in the South, that there must be a kind of seething resentment on the part of non-slaveholding white Southerners against these elite slaveholders. And the problem with that assumption was that um, many of those non-slaveholders had bought in for reasons uh, that, I, that I suggested. But it's important to note that the meaning of the class differences varies depending on our setting. So in the mountainous South, in Western Virginia and North Carolina and Eastern Tennessee and Kentucky, in Northern Georgia, in the places where plantation agriculture hadn't taken 
uh, taken a root uh, to the extent that it had in the sort of low country and tide water, we do see more unionism. We do see more resentment of the planter class and the way that they had dominated uh, the politics of these states. We do see pockets of, uh, of unionism uh, there. We also see some pockets of white Southern unionism in some surprising places. I wrote a book about a Richmond spy uh, for, the, for the union right there in the heart of the Confederate capital. But um, part of the way that the Union Army tried to encourage these class differences to come to the fore was by presenting itself as a potential protector and provider uh, for Southerners in occupied areas. So Benjamin Butler, for example, gets to New Orleans in the spring of 1862, is set up there as the head of the occupying forces in New Orleans, and immediately can see that the people are starving. So he, he, he uh, sets up policies to provide um, uh, the poor with food and to clean the city up and to bring some modern social services to it. Uh, people will sometimes uh, ask me, you know, why was there no Marshall Plan in the South? So akin to the, 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 the sort of generous provisions uh, that the US government made for uh, allies and, and former enemies after World War II. And the answer is that there was a kind of Marshall Plan, the Freedmen's Bureau, which we associate rightly with helping the freedmen in their transition to freedom, also distributed rations to whites in the South, to poor whites, tens of thousands of them in some Southern states, these poor whites received more rations uh, and more aid than, uh, than the free people did. Uh, so there was a very um, uh, conscious policy of trying to bring these class divisions to the fore by, um, by uh, uh, promoting what this one scholar has put, the loyalty of the stomach, uh, 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 providing um, uh, uh, some, some food and aid uh, to Southerners in, in, in occupied areas. Uh, second question I got here says, Southerners refer to the war as the war of Northern aggression. What, what say you? Um, that's the war of Northern aggression. Or th those are obviously sort of uh, fighting words themselves. And I think that uh, that speaks volumes. Uh, I think that we have a very clear consensus now among Civil War historians from which no serious historian, uh, you know, departs that uh, what uh, the root cause of the Civil War was the desire of secessionists to preserve and extend slavery uh, and, and uh, the, the sense that the slave power, that this small conspiracy of uh, elite slaveholders and some sort of truckling Northern Democratic uh, toadies as Republicans saw it, the idea um, that the slave power was never satisfied, that whatever concession or compromise would be made would lead to further demands. Is, uh, this is one of the views that, that um, uh, motivates Northerners in 1861 to take a stand. One might ask, and some people at the time asked, well, shouldn't this, we just let the South go? Good riddance. There was some good riddance talk, but the vast majority of Northerners believed that um, that uh, compromise would lead to further demands uh, and that to say good riddance would spell the end of, of this, this noble experiment in representative government and, and, and majority rule. Uh, third question, good question I see here. Uh, why did Western Virginia decide to separate from Virginia? Why not all Virginia? Well, here we get back to that point I made about uh, sort of regional distinctions within the South. The, the, uh, these Western uh, counties in the, in the mountain South had a really uh, quite a different economy and quite a different culture. They, they, uh, uh, residents often felt they had more in common with residents of Pennsylvania and Ohio than they did with the residents of Tidewater, Virginia. Then there was very old political fault lines that went back into the early 19th century. Uh, some of those Westerners felt that Easterners, Eastern slaveholders had gerrymandered districts, had written tax laws and so on that benefited the wealthy slaveholders at the expense of those uh, to, uh, to the West. Um, that separatism in West Virginia by and large was not anti-slavery, uh, it, it, uh, although some, uh, some opponents of slavery do come to the fore of the West Virginia statehood movement. It was a, a much more an anti-planter, anti-Eastern aristocrat sort of uh, sort of view that, that, um, that tapped uh, these, these uh, longstanding fault lines. Uh, so Virginia has an internal geography as some of the Southern states do that sort of mirrors the divisions within the South as a whole. And again, when we look to those mountain regions, 
we see these regional fault lines. A county like the one where I'm talking to you from right now, Albemarle County, so-called Piedmont County, um, was a slaveholding county and followed the political lead of, the, of, of Eastern Virginia rather than uh, breaking uh, toward, uh, toward the, the West. Um, no other Southern state split in, in, in quite this way as this um, uh, questioner has asked as a follow-up, but there were divisions in other Southern states, particularly Eastern Tennessee, a mountain stronghold, a unionist stronghold. Lincoln is uh, under a lot of pressure from the start to liberate uh, the unionists of East Tennessee. We see unionism in Northern Alabama uh, and Northern Georgia. Again, we see it in Western uh, North Carolina, pretty much as you follow the Appalachian mountain range is where you're gonna find this kind of regional based uh, unionism. Uh, it says here, another question I heard uh, from an older gent grew up in Lower, Lower Alabama on a plantation. He said, many of the former slaves refused to leave and continued their families on an Alabama plantation. So. Um, important thing to note is that we emphasize a great deal the flight of slaves from plantation to union line, plantations to union lines during the war. And if you think about it, uh, it's so important to understand the context here. Slave flight had been a major form of resistance, a major drain uh, on, on slavery and a major uh, uh, sort of point of contention in national politics for a very long time. But before the war, slave flight was mostly from places like Maryland and Virginia that were close to the North. If you were a slave in Virginia, there's one place you wanted to get, and that was Philadelphia. Maryland was a slave state. Delaware was a slave state. You might have a chance of getting to Philadelphia from Virginia. You had no chance to get to Philadelphia virtually, although there's some remarkable exceptions from places like Alabama. So what we see during the war is that as the Union Army penetrates these regions of the Deep South, we see slaves able to take the risk of flight. It's always a risk, even with the Union Army present. Masters did all they could to punish and discourage flight. But nonetheless, we see slave flight. It's important to note that there are vast regions of the South the Union Army didn't penetrate. There are many Southern slaves who felt they couldn't take that risk for one reason or another. But those who stayed behind during the war on plantations nonetheless found ways to resist and destabilize slavery. And there's a wonderful literature now that shows that all forms of resistance, what we call silent sabotage, small scale resistance and so on, uh, and defiance, there's an uptick of all of that sort of resistance uh, during, uh, during the war. After the war, um, uh, uh, the free people sought mobility. The promise of a free labor system is that it's a system in which you can take your labor power and go and find the best terms under which to work. But under Andrew Johnson, the, uh, his lenient policy towards former Confederates permitted former Confederates to come back to power in Southern states and they instantly set up so-called vagrancy laws that made it a crime for the free people to be on the road looking for the best terms and it was meant to pressure them on, into staying put on the plantations where they had, uh, they had worked before the war. So the question of mobility was a political question. When uh, congressional reconstruction starts uh, and we have African-Americans and white Southern unionists and union league uh, uh, agents and so on on the scene in the South, those vagrancy laws are, are, are uh, are, are disallowed and some of the promise of free labor is is um, is fulfilled, but but uh, uh, mobility was a was a was a, again a highly politicized issue. Um, I see another question here: How much was slavery an economic engine of the South, and was there a plan proffered by the North to replace the resulting economic loss? That's another excellent question. Excellent questions all, and the answer is yes. There was a plan proffered by the North. Uh, for a long time, moderate opponents of slavery, those who were uncertain that they uh, could support any kind of federally mandated immediate emancipation, moderate critics of slavery, including Lincoln, had favored uh, what we call anti-slavery gradualism, which was a program of um, gradual compensated emancipation in which slaveholders would be compensated for the financial loss of their slaves. And some abolitionists really dislike this because they said you're, it's too much of a concession to the idea that people are property if you pay Southern slaveholders off. But many moderates thought this was the only way you were gonna get them to agree. So during the war, Lincoln repeatedly offers what the historian William Freeling has called a sweetheart deal to slaveholders. 
agree to, to free your slaves, maybe in some gradual formula over decades. Uh, and the federal government will pay you for those slaves. And Lincoln makes this offer to border state slaveholders in places like Delaware and Maryland and Missouri, especially saying, look, the writing's on the wall. Slaves are fleeing plantations. The war is destroying slavery. While you still have a chance, take my offer, money in exchange for your slaves. I'll send them away from the United States somewhere to a colony like Liberia. Again and again, uh, slaveholders reject that sweetheart deal. They're absolutely unwilling to give up their slaves, even in uh, the so-called loyal uh, slaveholding states. And so Lincoln eventually embraces uh, the Emancipation Proclamation in part because he's so often been rebuffed in this offer of a gradual compensated uh, emancipation. Slaveholders were simply unwilling to give up slavery. Any other questions, friends? Those are all ex excellent questions. I see we're we're coming Lizzie, to the end of our time. We've just about run out of time. If that's yeah. so, um, hey, thank you so very, very much. We oh, cannot... my great pleasure. And 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 again, I, I applaud all of you for being affiliated with this wonderful and so so important and so noble institution of the Union League. And I wish I wish you all the best. That list, thanks very much. All right. All right. For those of you who are still watching and listening, uh, just a little reminder that for the next three Wednesday nights at 530, uh, the Legacy Foundation sponsors a public affairs program that will deal specifically with the COVID situation as it is right now. All right. Uh, and then on the fourth Wednesday of June, uh, every month as it is, uh, we will have our Civil War Roundtable. And on June the 24th, you get to look at and listen to me. Uh, and we, But actually, it'd be a fascinating talk, I think, I hope, on the United States colored troops and the involvement of the Union League in organizing, promoting, and protecting them during the war itself. And there's a wonderful story there, a true Philadelphia story and a Union League story. So, so I hope you'll, you'll tune in on June the 24th, but every Wednesday in June at 5.30. So thank you one, thank you all. Uh, be well, stay safe. We'll see you next week. Thank you. <laughs>